线上的朋友，大家早安！好、哦，我是国立海洋科技博物馆，呃，这一次的主办人陈立淑，好、哦，产学交流组的主任陈立淑。那今天很高兴，欢迎大家上线哈、哦。待会儿，呃，在一分钟后，我们整个演讲就会正式的开始。好、哦，在开始之前，先跟各位提几件，提醒几件事情，就是说。我们在演讲的过程当中，哈，那请大家不要在 YouTube 下面留言。等到我们这个演讲结束后，如果你们有要提什么问题的话，就那时候再欢迎你们把它留在下面。好，好。那最主要为什么说在演讲的过程当中，希望大家，诶，不要留言，就是在第一个部分，因为是有英文，然后我们有那个编辑，呃，小编会协助把翻译打在下面。那如果大家如果留言的话，他会把那个翻译把它弄乱掉，所以可能就，呃，就不太好。所以就是麻烦大家配合，就是待会演讲的时候记得、哦、不要留言哈、哦、啊，有什么问题要问的话，就演讲完之后。在留言，好，谢谢。哎，大家早安，好、哦，我们现在呃论坛要正式开始的，好、哦。大家早安，很欢迎大家在礼拜六的早晨参加“还好有女”海洋女力论坛。这是台湾第一次，我们呃聚焦在海洋，好，那邀请很多专家学者、产官学的专家一起来参加这样的一个论坛。在我们论坛开始之前，首先邀请我们海科馆的大家长陈树芬馆长为大家致欢迎词。然后我们接下来就请我们的陈馆长上线来跟大家 say hello。各位线上伙伴，大家好。嗯，海客馆今天很感谢教育部的支持，让我们能够举办这一个二零二一嗯还好有女。海洋女力的一个论坛。那今天这个论坛最主要是因要呼应呃联合国 SDGs 这个永续发展的第五项的指标——性别平权，好这样的一个议题。那呃特别来探讨，尤其是像很多的理工或者是数理这样的一个呃比较硬的、比较深色的这样的一个议题。呃，大部分可能国人一般的印象就是都是以男生为主。那其实以现在社会的发展来说，其实这些议题已经开始越来越多的女性是有兴趣的，而且越来越多的女性也正是在参与之中。那尤其以海客馆来说，呃，海客馆其实这样的一个议题牵涉到海洋的面向有非常多元，包含了海洋科技、海洋科学、海洋的能源等等，这些听起来还是一样就是那么硬，但是可以想象得到，目前其实有非常多的。这个海洋女性的科学家，其实也都有在参与这样的一个非常，呃，数理跟理工这样的一个呃面向的一个呃这一些职业。那其实我们也看到了，呃，女性在参与这些职业的时候，其实也都。并不是特别的弱势，好，并不是特别的弱势。那他们也会去注意到，就是不管跟男性之间的这个和平相处或互相尊重上面，好，甚至是呃，有时候会特别是小心一下，就是可能不小心的一些侵犯等等，那都会特别去注意到。所以，可是这样的一个东西，呃，需要更多人来参与，也需要更多人知道。好，那所以今天其实我们很感谢。我们呃邀请了非常多呃，就是国内外的一些知名的这个海洋女力的科学家，包含包含了那个 Nova 的一位呃，就是博士是 Alan 博士，啊、呃，他也是在海洋能源的部分是非常有名的。那还有我们国内外的非常多的知名的这些海洋女力的呃专家学者，或者是我们地方的首长，那一起跟我们来探究在海洋这样的一个议题。那呃，其实女性的一个参与，那他们的经验到底是什么？好、呃，是大概是。这样的一个呃呃这样的一个论坛。Good morning, uh, our honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm the director of the、uh, National Museum of Marine Science and Technology. I'm Su Fen Chen. Uh, 
It's my pleasure and honor to welcome you all participants in the 2021 uh, Women in Marine Science online forum. All speakers we invited today were dedicated their passion and efforts to marine industry, from marine science, marine education, uh, marine literature to marine tourism. We also have some really important scientists, professors, uh, principals, writers, and directors to share their best experience and stories. I believe all of know the importance of the ocean, but how to inspire much more people uh, to get to know the ocean, to get close to the ocean, and even to love ocean would be our biggest goal and the mission. Hope all of us might uh, keep in contribution uh, by out a uh, patient towards the ocean industry, no matter who able. As long as we put efforts uh, into the fields, we could make the ocean better. Thanks uh, for your participation again. We should enjoy this form. Thank you. 接下来的时间，我们会交给，呃，我们特别邀请到，呃，海委会海保署的副署长寿新珍，好、哦，来帮我们主持这一个 session。The following session will be hosted by 宋新珍，哦 ，He is the Deputy Director General in Ocean Conservation Administration。呃 ，Let's welcome。Okay. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you uh, here to join this uh, virtual forum, and it's my pleasure to be the host of this section, Marine Science of Women Power in Ocean Forum. And uh, as for uh, Dr. Chen said, I'm I'm Xin Zhen Song, Deputy Director General of Ocean Conservation Administration, and affiliated as Ocean Affairs Council. And the topic of this section is marine science. And we, first of all, we have we will have a speech, a keynote speech by Elaine Ramirez from NOAA, and she is going to talk women in science using satellite imagery to bring awareness to ocean pollution. And、um, Elaine is a supervisory physical scientist. Scientists in the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Satellite Analysis Branch, and、uh, she is responsible for the development and operations of satellite-based valued-added interpretive analysis for a variety of hazards and disasters, including the adva advancement. Of the detection of marine oil and marine plastic, I had met Elaine since September 2016 in Taiwan EPA, and EPA at that time EPA held a seminar related to marine pollution response practices, and Elaine came to Taiwan and gave us a very impressive in presentation. About the use of remote sensing technology on marine pollution, and while in EPA and nowadays in Ocean Conservation Administration, we have a lot of cooperation issued on marine debris and、uh, marine pollution, and use remote sensing technology through、uh, Center for Space and Remote Sensing Research. And、uh, after、uh, Elaine's keynote speech. We will have two presenters who are Meng Wan Ye, and from the Institute of Marine Environmental Science and Technology, and Professor Ye, and、uh, she、uh, teach in National Taiwan Normal University, and her expertise is in tectonic and、uh, structure evolution on Southeast Asia. And、um, she is also focused on marine science picture book, and that's very interesting. And yesterday, I saw an interview、uh, with、uh, Dr. Ye on the internet, 
about the development about the use of uh, about the development of women power on marine science and i was very impressive so today we can uh, listen to um, professor yes introduction about the the women power in marine science i think um that's looking forward i believe it will be very interesting and after uh, professor ye we will have um dr li su chen from national museum of marine science and technology and she is the head and she was the head of education and exception diversion for 6 years and nowadays she is promoting marine citizen scientists scientists project for coral and horse crab and um, i met uh, dr chen for quite a long time we know each other for quite a long time and uh, have a lot of and i have a lot of assistance from her in all aspects so um that's a, a brief uh, introduction about today's uh, forum so um now that's welcome uh, elen ramirez ni hao hello <laughs> good morning thank you so much for having me here today i'm very honored to be in the presence of such distinguished female guests my name is ellen ramirez i work in the united states national oceanic and atmospheric administration i'm a supervisory scientist in satellite analysis and we use remote sensing platforms to monitor hazards and disasters uh today i would like to share my perspectives on what it's like to be a female lead and hope that i can motivate some of the younger audience to promote women in science it's very important that we have the perspectives and creativity of the younger female generations and for the technical component i'll be talking on what we're doing at noaa and how we're using satellite data to monitor and mitigate ocean pollution including oil spills and marine debris i will present my slides Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes. Excellent. Again, thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm ready to present. So again, my my name is Ellen. I'm a physical scientist. I work in NOAA. I've been working for NOAA for the past 10 years. My focus is on satellite remote sensing to aid in disaster response efforts. I'm very passionate about protecting the oceans and I'm a strong promoter of women in science. So the overview of this presentation is as follows. I'd like to give you my background in my younger years as a child and progress to my formal education. and how it evolved into a career and then focus on opportunities research projects and then motivation for protecting the oceans so here here is me as a child um i was very adventurous i had an interest in science i especially liked weather and severe weather i liked thunderstorms tornadoes and i grew up in a part of the united states where we got that type of weather and i had support from my parents uh i liked being in the outdoors um the middle picture i thought one day i wanted to go to space and work for nasa so th- this was uh my interest as a younger child so any of the younger audience 
looking to pursue uh, careers in science, you, you know, make sure you you find something that you're passionate about mm -hmm. and then pursue it. Mm -hmm. So this this is this is my start. <laughs> and uh, as I got older and moving on to college, I, I decided to study weather. I decided to study meteorology and atmospheric science. So I started on the southeast coast of the United States, where the dot is around Florida in Melbourne. Mm. And they are prone to hurricanes and storm surges and marine debris. I was involved with a lot of beach cleanups. Um, I got to experience some very powerful hurricanes, um, tropical cyclones, typhoons that affected that area. And so that's what I wanted to go on to study. And the, and the best way to study that type of weather phenomenon is through satellites. So after I finished my undergraduate degree in Florida, I moved across the country to Salt Lake City, Utah, and got involved with using satellites to monitor rapid intensification of tropical cyclones. So that th this was pivotal in my career because this is the point in time that I became hooked on satellite remote sensing. And that's 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 when I knew that this is what I wanted to study throughout the remainder of my career is using satellite data to help provide information for hazards and disasters to help mitigate for response, for natural resource damage assessment, for, re for recovery of the environment. Um, it was very clear to me that, that remote sensing is the key tool in observations, and especially if you want to protect the oceans. Mm -hmm. So after I completed graduate school, I got a job at NOAA as a contractor. And again, I moved across the country to the Washington DC area. And that's where I currently live and work. And I've, I've done this job for about 10 years now. So the bottom picture is the, the building that I, that I work at. It's called the NOAA Center for Weather and Climate Prediction. And we've, we've hosted several Taiwanese colleagues from the Center for Space and Remote Sensing Research mm -hmm. in Taipei on numerous occasions. And if you have the opportunity to visit the United States in the DC area, do let me know, I'd be happy to provide a tour. What's so interesting about right the current time right now is that we're working from home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we, we are operating our analyses from home offices mm -hmm. on laptops. It can be quite difficult, but we have a strong mission and it's mm -hmm. continued and we've had no gaps in that mission. Mm -hmm. So in the NOAA satellite analysis branch, we use satellite data to monitor five different areas. We monitor fire active fire pixels and smoke. We monitor for marine pollution, both oil spills and marine debris. We monitor for volcanic ash in the atmosphere because it's hazardous to aircrafts. We monitor heavy precipitation events, and then we monitor tropical cyclones for position and intensity estimates. So that's the, the overview. Um, I started as an analyst back in 2011, and I now supervise the unit. It's, um, it's not always very easy work. It's, I'm very lucky to be able to monitor hazards and disasters. I, I'm very passionate about it, but it can be difficult work. It's rotating shift work. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single day of the year. 
there's somebody that is behind these computer screens performing the analysis. So again, geared towards the younger audience with hard work and dedication and perseverance, you can create a huge impact to the environment and to your community and to your country by dedication at your job, it, but it's not always easy. I have worked um, several uh, nights, weekends, holidays. So these pictures are our computer screens in the office and the picture on the right, I want to highlight because I have a shirt on that looks like Santa Claus. And it's because that that year, it was my turn to work Christmas Eve and to work overnight, but somebody has to do it. It's a 24 by seven job. And it, it actually worked out well for me that night. I have uh, three kids, including two daughters who I, I try to be a role model for. I told them that I would look for Santa Claus in the satellite imagery. And they said, okay, mom, you can go to work. So I like, I like that picture. So now I want to move into the technical aspects of the role. And one of the main objectives of this presentation, and it's that we are facing some global crises in the form of pollution in the oceans. So I will talk about two of those sources of pollution. The first being marine debris and marine litter that makes its way into rivers, into lakes, into oceans. And also to talk about oil spills. So for my bullet points on this slide, I wanted to emphasize that you know, for too long, the oceans have been repositories for the toxic waste and garbage. And it's very easy to dump trash or litter. And sometimes it's directly in the ocean. Other times you don't know that if you litter inland that it might make its way into the ocean. So that's, that's also important as well. But we have to take care of our space. We have to take care of our environment. We have to keep in mind that we're influencing younger generations. Our actions will directly impact the future of younger generations. So one of my favorite quotes that I've come across in the past few years is the bottom bullet. And it says, you can't manage what you can't measure. So we have a pollution crisis on a global scale, but if you can't see it and there's not awareness, then it's very difficult to enact change because people either don't know what's going on or they don't know it's a problem. And so one of the best ways to bring awareness to ocean pollution is through the use of satellite observations. So I will start with oil spills. So NOAA has been monitoring oil spills for about 10 years now, around since the time that I started at NOAA. And I'm not talking about natural oil spills. I'm talking about non-natural oil spills. And the sources could come from production platforms. This is the offshore energy infrastructure and their drilling units. This is how we put gasoline in our cars. This is how we propel vessels. So there's a, there's a high demand for oil worldwide. The pipeline networks that transfer that oil from offshore to inland, 
they can be susceptible to leaks and breaks, and then they create oil spills in the offshore environment. There's also oil from shipwrecks. And it may seem like a small contribution, but there are thousands of shipwrecks worldwide that have sank to the seafloor. And over time, their oil tanks develop pinhole leaks, and then they produce an oil spill. Um, another source is from vessels, like in the bottom image. There are vessels that will intentionally release their used oil waste out into the open water. And you might be wondering why they do that. Um, and the answer is there's a cost incentive. It costs a lot of money, probably tens of thousands of US dollars to pay to properly dispose of your oil waste when you get to a port. But instead of doing that, you could also just discharge it into the ocean and, and most likely nobody would ever know about it. And so that, that's a way that mariners save money. Um, the last source of marine pollution is from storage facilities that are inland. This very top picture is an example of oil storage facilities that were damaged from a Category 5 typhoon, a Category 5 hurricane in the Bahamas. And you can see three of these storage tanks have lids and six of them no longer have lids due to the wind. And there was oil spilled from this incident as well. So the, the best way to monitor these types of events is with satellite data. It's, it's cost effective and it's, a proven technique to be able to detect oil in the marine environment. So what we do at NOAA is we have somebody 24 by seven. So somebody's working right now. It's not me, but we have, I have an analyst that's working and analyzing radar data and visible data in the uh, visible spectrum to look for oil spills. So here's an example of a report that we might produce. Underneath this green dot is a drilling facility. And then we can clearly see spilled oil emanating from it. This report is from September 18th of 2021. And it's off the coast of Florida on the Southeast United States. So without satellite data, this spill could have gone unnoticed. Nobody would have known, but with satellite surveillance, we were able to report and the US Coast Guard will send a team out to investigate the incident. Um, so I found another statistic from the internet on the left that I'll highlight here. And I was so surprised by this, but it said that in 2002, so this was about 20 years ago, there was a report delivered by the European Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And it estimated that the annual cost of properly and lawfully disposing of used oil from a vessel it costs between 30,000 and 150,000 US dollars per year. And so this is why the mariners and shipping industries and cruise lines and cruise line industries might choose to dispose of oil in the ocean. But the you know the oceans should not be treated as that type of a dumping ground. Um Another source of oil pollution in the ocean can come from natural disasters. And globally, there has been a lot of those this year. The one in, that impacted the United States most recently was Hurricane Ida in 
the fall of 2021, this was a major cyclone, major hurricane, major typhoon, and made landfall on the coast of Louisiana. It went through the Gulf of Mexico over hundreds of platforms, and it produced hundreds of oil spills. And it was very difficult for the response to be able to focus their attention on where they should clean up, where they should contain, what should they do, which region should they focus on. Um, so that we at the NOAA Satellite Analysis Branch, we, we requested additional imagery and we ended up generating over 50 reports to find oil spills like what you see on the right. There's a platform impacted by the cyclone and this yellow polygon represents the delineation of the oil that we could see on the marine surface. So then it let the, no it let the responders know that there was an incident underway. So I want to play a game to make sure that I have your attention in the audience. So I'm going to propose a scenario for you to perform satellite analysis. So th these two scenes, there's one on the left and there's one on the right. Both of these are space-based radar. And radar tells us something about the roughness on the surface of the ocean. So oil film will dampen very, very tiny wind-driven waves, making it look smooth and dark. So this, this exercise is meant to highlight how difficult it is to perform satellite analysis of oil in the marine environment. So there's a dark feature on the left here. And on the right, there's a dark feature here where my cursor is. Both of these are very close to land. Both of these are very close to areas of drilling. One of these is an oil spill. And one of these is a false positive. So I encourage you to take a moment and look at both the images and make a self-determination which one is an oil spill. Okay. And if you've um, made your estimates, it is the one on the left that is an oil spill. There's a refinery that's very close to this red arrow and it was impacted by a weather event and it created an oil sheen. Over here on the right, there was beach erosion. And so this dark area is actually biogenic material. It's natural vegetation from the beach as a result of erosion. So you can see how our job is, is quite difficult. So now I, I want to focus on a case, a success case for cooperation between NOAA and Taiwan. You have colleagues in Taiwan from the Center for Space and Remote Sensing Research that also perform their own analysis of oil pollution in the marine environment. And we are very honored to have an established cooperation with them where if they see an anomaly in Taiwan waters, they can ask us at NOAA Satellite Analysis if we concur with their assessment. So this is back from 2018, colleagues at CSRSR in Taiwan said, there's a possible vessel with a possible oil anomaly trailing from it. That's the image on the left. And they asked 
for our expertise at NOAA to help corroborate this assessment. So I'm very privileged to say that I, I got to help with this, this particular assessment. We looked at the definition of the oil on the right. We looked at wind data. We looked at ocean current data. We looked at environmental data. And we determined that there was likely a discharge from the vessel. And so if you're curious about this incident after the presentation, you can go to any of these links and they will be informing that this was the first case in Taiwanese waters that a vessel operating company was penalized for possible oil discharge and pollution to the environment. So it's a very big success case back in 2018 and, and we continue to work with CSRSR. So next I want to change gears to talk about the ocean plastics crisis and what NOAA is doing about that. I came across this graph a few months ago and this solid curve on the graph says, if we do not curtail plastic leakage into the marine environment, which ends up in the oceans, we are going to more than quadruple the millions of tons per year of plastics that enter the ocean, which is going toxic for both the marine life, um, both plant and animal species. And so this, this graph really startled me and it began to make me think, you know, how, how can we promote different practices and how can we come together to um, make, make communities aware of this crisis that is on the horizon? And it's very difficult to do because it goes back to you can't manage what you can't measure. You know, so what, to what extent is the ocean suffering from plastics and marine debris and marine litter? So the, the, the dashed line in the middle, it says unsustained intervention. So unsustained intervention would mean that there's a concerted effort to promote the mitigation of, of plastics that enter the marine environment. But as you can see, the curve still rises. And then sustained intervention would be perseverance, dedication, awareness, motivation to uh, recycle, to pick up litter, to, to do your civic part to help with preventing garbage and then secondly, preventing it from entering the marine environment. And this is something I, as I mentioned before, I have two daughters. I also have a son. And so this is made me think I, you know, I need to teach them um, to not be wasteful to, you know, to pick up their, their garbage, you know, to not use single use plastics. I, I move them away from straws and from plastics that might be disposed of easily. So I, I try to be very, very mindful of that. Um, so the background on how NOAA came into monitoring marine debris it goes back to an event that happened in 2011. There was a massive earthquake off the east coast of Japan. It generated a major tsunami. It was a very, very devastating event. We requested satellite data to help try to monitor the situation. And in the yellow box, you can see that the port is nearly underwater. This is a um, image taken from a spacecraft. 
a satellite. And on the right, where you would normally see buildings, if you notice, the land is nearly flat. The wave was so strong and it was so powerful and it generated so much marine debris that was swept into the ocean. There was a lot of focus on the lives and property after this incident as there should be. Uh, but we at NOAA, we were also beginning to study and learn about environmental impacts and how to use satellite to detect marine debris. So three days after the tsunami, this is another satellite image. Every single one of these little white dots in, in areas, these are debris rafts and we could see them from space. They were that large. And so we could see them with our eyes, but we also decided to perform a, a further analysis and look at the spectral information to see how these rafts emit. And so we, we developed a, a, what we call a spectral library. It's a spectral fingerprint. So we could try to spectrally identify debris. And then our goal was to run a target detection. So here's a zoomed in look of the marine debris rafts. And when we took all of those pixels and we exported libraries, marine debris spectral libraries, we could run target detection. So what you see on the right in the inset, the red outlines, is what an algorithm automatically identified as marine debris. So we decided to run this type of algorithm in open water it was very difficult. We had mixed success and mixed results um, because uh, over time, the marine debris, it will break down. It becomes very small. Plastics become smaller and smaller. The heavier debris will sink. And so we, we had difficulty exercising that algorithm in open water. You know, but we continue to look for sources of macroplastics, the larger plastics in open waters. And one of them that we identified are derelict nets from fishing gear. So this person in the photo is standing on a net that was lost by a fishing vessel. And he's inside of an atoll in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So this net was accidentally lost by fishermen and it snagged on coral reef and it was creating a hypoxic zone. It was damaging the coral reef. It was entangling animals. And the really neat thing about this situation, if there is a neat thing, is that we could see it in satellite. So the, the two images on the right are black and white in a very high resolution about 50 centimeters resolution. And on the left is the color information about 1.5 meters resolution. But if you note in this bottom right graphic, there's a curvature and you can see it in the same photo where the man is standing on the derelict net. So th this, this was very important ground validation and ground verification for satellite analysis because we realized we can see larger floating debris on the surface of the ocean, but the ocean is so vast. So it's our goal at NOAA and what we're continuing to work on is to try to quantify the macroplastics and then ultimately try to quantify microplastics in the open ocean so we can quantify and bring awareness to the global crisis that is marine debris. So in terms of spectral signatures, if there are any technical geeks in the audience, what we're looking for is a peak at 840 nanometers in wavelength it's indicative that there's a plastic signature when we see a peak. Water has a very characteristic curve. It has a downward trend and no peaks. 
We've also learned about sea foam and white caps and biogenic material, but there's something distinct about plastics that you can't see with your eye that you can see in how it emits back up to the satellite sensor. So we, when we perform a spectral inspection, we're looking at that portion of the wavelength. We're also currently investigating wavelengths in the near infrared. Not all sensors take those measurements, however. So uh, current work is to continue to build spectral libraries. Here's one interesting case I wanted to highlight before I conclude is that when we run target detection out in the open Pacific Ocean, we can now find pixels. So if you look at the crosshairs on this, this red crosshairs, you look underneath the red dot, you would never know by looking at it that that's probably marine plastic. But when we perform a spectral interrogation from target detection, we see the peak at 840 nanometers. And it's a really good indication that there's either a macroplastic or an aggregate of plastics underneath that point. So we're continuing to work with nonprofit organizations who might have resources to investigate pixels. Um, it's very tough work because the ocean is a very vast place. Yeah, but it's our goal to bring awareness by detecting the extent and the scope of the problem. And then we can take that information, we can take that tangible information and deliver it throughout the government and hopefully change legislation, regulations, and accountability for the responsible parties for this type of pollution. My conclusion statements, I want to circle back and say to the young audience, if there are children watching, pursue your interests, do it with extreme passion, dedication, and perseverance, and you will succeed. Identify a subject that that you're passionate about, and then it will never feel like work. Um, even when I have to work night shifts, I love what I do. To the general public in the audience, think, I encourage you to think and brainstorm ways to guard and safe keep the environment in your everyday activities. Um, say no to the single use plastics, um, participate in, in beach cleanups, um, you know, conduct your own research on the internet and it's, it's, it's never too late to pursue an education or be a part of something that you're passionate as well. Um, I, I encourage my father who's almost 70 years old to do the same and to help teach younger generations, including my kids, you know, how to, how to pick up, garbage or clean up after themselves. Um, if they walk to the bus stop, see a piece of trash, pick it up. To the technical professionals, uh, if any of you are in the audience, leverage remote sensing technologies, satellite, drone, um, aircraft. There, there's a lot of different ways to monitor the marine environment. And collectively, we can help bring awareness to the extent of ocean pollution. And then to everyone listening, this is such an important part. Encourage and support the rising females in your personal circles, in your professional circles. Women have a way of being very creative and resourceful. I've been very fortunate myself to have support from my family, from, from friends, and from colleagues. I started as an analyst in NOAA in 10 years ago. And now I get to manage and supervise the entire unit. So hard work pays off and um, everyone can benefit from having women in science. So 
I lastly, I would like to say a huge thank you to the the National Museum of Marine and Science and Technology in Keelung. I had the opportunity to visit in 2018 on a work trip, and I was in awe. It was um, the exhibits were fantastic. You know, they promoted clean oceans and solutions to debris. And I, I was just amazed. And um, I took these photos. The, the ocean was very rough at the time. There was a super typhoon hmm. a few hundred kilometers away. <laughs> so yeah. there's a lot of waves, of waves behind us in the bottom picture. But thank you and shishé. Okay. Uh, thank you, Elaine. It's very, um, I'm very delighted with your presentation. And in the beginning, you mentioned about the enthusiasm and the curiosity in the processing of, of growing up and um, studying while studying. And I believe it's very important, the enthusiasm to keep and the curiosity. And you also mentioned the ship grounded, the ship accident. And um, for me, because I'm in charge of that. So the ship grounded accidents always happened in night and in weekend and in holiday. I have a son. So yeah, it's, um, it's really a, a big issue. And when I promise him something, yeah. And, and, um, the, about the remote sensing technology and it's a, a big cell, big scale monitoring method. And uh, nowadays we are setting up a um, platform use uh, big data and uh, the AI analysis. And I believe it will make a, a great help on the um, marine debris issue. And now the following, I will introduce um, Professor um, Meng Wan Ye, and so it's your floor. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, uh, thanks, uh, director, uh, and uh, uh, thanks, Alan, for your wonderful talk. I I really enjoy that. I start to see the future power of satellite analysis. Uh, however, uh, uh, may I? Ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. Um. So. So. I think. Uh. uh for. Uh, t by using satellite uh, analysis to detect uh, marine pollution, is a wonderful idea because the marine the ocean is so vast. So there is. Uh. It's a very efficient way to do that. But you also mentioned that it's very difficult for image detecting. Um. So right now is the oil spill and uh, plastic are the only detectable uh, uh, marine pollution by the imagery, or you can also detect other chemical uh, pollution. That's a great question. There, there's also a lot of different types of chemicals and, and gases that can be harmful to the environment as well. Right now on the marine surface, we're just looking for plastics and oil spills in two different endeavors. But we're also looking at atmospheric pollution as well. There's a lot, there's a very potent greenhouse gas methane that's released from the offshore energy structures. So some of the drilling platforms, it's also released from inland dump sites, from garbage sites. We're currently actively investigating using satellite imagery to detect that type of greenhouse, greenhouse gas and its contribution to climate change. It's one of the greenhouse gases that's that's uh, more potent. So uh, I think it's time to introduce myself to the audience. Um, so uh, should I use in English or Chinese? Uh, 
I know. I think if you can speak English and that Elaine can understand. I, okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, please wait for me to share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, hang on. Okay. How do I? Yes. All right. Okay, I think that's it. Yes. Okay. Um, well, hello everyone uh, and uh, the, all the online audiences. Uh, it's my honor to introduce myself. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Ming Wan Ye. I'm a professor at the Institute of Marine Environment and Technology at the SIDA. Okay. Uh, but actually, uh, my training was. Uh, I graduated from University of Maryland in the United States uh, with a double degree. One is marine biology, the other one is geology, because I love, uh, yeah, I love nature. So, so uh, as you can see, uh, I, I want to pass my love of nature to my kids. The, the photo is me with my daughter. <laughs> She's only uh, two months old during that time, <laughs> but all, all my kids uh, were uh, hitting the water uh, after two months old. So we, we that's our summer uh, family life. Okay, we soak up with water uh, because we have wonderful coral reefs in Taiwan, and I want to uh, preserve these wonderful coral reefs for my kids and for their kids. So um, other my um, research uh, in terms of geology or marine geology related, uh, I also uh, uh, want to pass the knowledge to the general audiences and especially the kids because the kids are the future. And that's why I, 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 I use uh, uh, picture books for kids, and I ask our undergrad student uh, within my course to come up with uh, marine science picture books. Um, so, if all of you are interested, uh, please uh, visit our website. I, I will show that later. And uh, um, and and my kids are my inspiration uh, in doing a lot of uh, scientific promotion. So other than marine science, I also promote all kinds of sciences, uh, mathematics, uh, physics, and chemistry. And the, that's the other project. We make uh, eight episodes of TV shows. It's called Happy Campus, because by pursuing knowledge is to solve problems for future human beings. So that's the whole purpose of learning. Um, that's the main uh, goal for this kind of uh, TV shows. And I also want to promote women in science. Um, so we also made another um, web page. Uh, we interviewed 30 female scientists or technology uh, workers <laughs> uh, uh, in Taiwan uh, across all different spectrums of ages. Uh, we share uh, why do we go on to pursuing science as a career. Like Ellen just said, it's a very difficult, uh, challenging work, but we, we loved it. You, you have to love it in order to pursue it. So how do you uh, feel the love that is strong enough to to pursue that is uh, a very important thing. So I think uh, uh, the, the main reason I made this uh, web page is to share that uh, uh, everyone is not alone and you might have doubt, you might have uh, um, a down uh, by facing a challenge, but uh, everyone is facing a challenge all the time. So we can, uh, um, by overcome and sharing our difficulties, we can overcome together. Okay, so that's the briefing of what I have been doing for the past 10 years. Uh, uh, a lot of different things. <laughs> but I, I, I love my job, like Alan. Okay, for the past uh, 15 years, 
Um, my, my job is to look at, uh, it's different. Uh, Alan's job is using satellite imaging to monitoring all the conditions of uh, the marine and atmosphere. My job is go across the world to pick up rocks. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we pick up rocks uh, because all the nature history is preserved within the rocks. Uh, even though the closure of uh, uh, ocean and the opening of a new ocean for the past uh, long history of Earth. And during that time, uh, the, the, the tectonic evolution and the climate system and the effect uh, of the whole Earth system is also preserved within the Earth, so uh, uh, within the rock sample. So my job is to go across the world uh, uh, okay, for the for the, all the audiences, uh, um, if you love to travel, and this is the kind of travel that uh, would not take you to any tourist site, <laughs> but, but very remote uh, area. However, you get to really know the Earth uh, in that location, and not only right now but also to the past, okay? So uh, if you love that kind of different uh, aspect of traveling and understanding the world, uh, please join us, you know, the, the start marks the places I have been for the past 10 years, okay? So you would uh, not imagine, and, and the best part is you do not need to pay by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this is the job that I, 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 I got paid to go. Okay. So it's like uh, uh, this, this picture here uh, with the boat fleet. Um, um, uh, two, uh, about 300, 200 and 300 years ago, the, the biggest um, expedition uh, of China is uh, So the, the, the marine fleet uh, went to uh, uh, the tip of uh, Africa from China. And through this expedition, uh, we established a lot of trade and a lot of findings and, and also a lot of understandings across the world. So that's what my job had taken me as well. So I, 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 I become aware of international conditions and uh, I make friends across the world. And hey Mary, I, hello. Yes, yes. The the slide did not go with your speech. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, and, sorry. And could you use the presentation mode? Oh, okay. So I'll use the presentation mode. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, me... just for you. No, don't don't worry. Yes. Uh, okay. So let me try again. <laughs> Please let me know because I cannot see the the. Uh, hey, but. Um, no, the the PowerPoint you know, we cannot see it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, hmm. uh, because I quit uh, sharing. Oh, know. okay. So let me see. Hmm. Okay, let's try that again. Okay. Okay. How about if I do this? Okay. You can choose the presentation mode. The yes, this one. Yes. Okay. How about that? So can can if I change the slide, can everyone see the change? No, there's oh. <laughs> that. Okay. You, you you can choose the one next to the the screen. Just like a book. Yes. So I uh, see both way. So I will use the screen. Google Chrome 
那个 PowerPoint 的 control。OK， right， right。So let me share again. Sorry. Uh, how about that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if I change、uh, the、mm -hmm. slide, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Excellent. All right. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So, so yes. The 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 stars are the places that、uh, my job had be able to take me. All right. So. So、uh, for all the audiences,、uh, yes, I, I think I got my wonderful job actually. <laughs> Even though、uh, I have to、uh, leave my family, but I was fortunate enough to have、uh, a very supportive family、um, and an understanding family.、Uh, so, so、uh, I think the most important thing is to pursue a career.、Uh, You have to be really respectful of what your career is, and you want to do the best, and the other people can respect you as well, and then really supportive to what you are doing. Okay, so、uh, for the past ten years, my work is to、uh, get this movie、uh, to understand how the Earth evolved for the past、uh, couple million years. Not couple. Three <laughs> hundred or five hundred million years. So we are、uh, reconstructing the temporal and spatial evolution of the geosphere、uh, of、uh, Southeast Asia,、mm -hmm. and we are using all kinds of different、uh, technologies: geochronology, geology, structural geology, and also、uh, paleontology, because. Uh, paleontology tell the the evolution of life tell us how the Earth environment changes. So we were、uh, having some、uh, advancement of understanding how the Earth system, the climate system, affect the tectonic system, and the whole 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 Earth is interlinked together. So the past. Even though we say the present is the key to the past, and、uh, the past can help us to understand and project the future, so that's my job. And、um, like、uh, Alan has said, uh, uh, bring the science to、um, the general public,、uh, pass it. I cannot hear you. Hello. You don't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about it. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so,、uh, how long have I been mute? <laughs> Maybe five seconds. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good.、Uh, <laughs> all right.、Uh, all right. Let me go back to that again. Yes. So, <laughs> so the the important thing is, as a professor at university, is is to、uh, pass the knowledge out and encourage、uh, young people to join us. Okay. So that's the. Past projects I have been doing, and the reason why、um, I want to make picture books for kids, I had said my kids were my inspiration, and uh, uh, so we 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 want to do picture books because,、uh, as Francis Bacon has said,、uh, knowledge is power. So uh, to uh, pass the knowledge、uh, to all. The young kids is to enforce power to them, so they can solve the problems in their lives and also solve the problems for the human beings for the future. So that's why I'm doing that as well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, by make, making the picture books,、uh, I want them to go to elementary school or kindergartens. To the the undergrad student has to go into society to tell the stories that they come up with, 
and then they to make uh, all the general publics aware uh, how important the marine um, life and marine environment is for us. Okay, so please do visit our website <laughs> if you have the time after the today's uh, forum. And uh, I think that's it um, to briefly go through uh, what I did and what I'm currently doing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ye. Your uh, speech is very interesting and I'm very delighted. Um, you mentioned the, the, most important, the most important thing is while you're working hard, I believe you will not be alone. And, and especially you mentioned about the picture book. And um, I believe the education from the childhood is the most important important thing and it's the key point to make people love the ocean and to engage with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your speech. And now I will turn to um, Dr. Li Shu Chen. I cannot hear you. Hello. Okay. Okay. First, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you, Elaine and uh, um, uh, Professor Ye. Uh, both talk is very interesting, especially uh, Elaine share the information about how they use satellite to analyze the pollution in the ocean. I think it's very, uh, it's very good. If uh, in the future we have the chance chance to cooperate uh, and uh, because we have the uh, marine protect area and uh, we have a se uh, serious problem about the marine pollution maybe you can help us to analyze uh, the source or the variation of the uh, when or how uh, or where the the debris uh, come to the uh, our marine protect area now uh, I'm going to share some uh, slide for you. Oh, the I, I'm I'm not I'm not only do the citizen science project uh, for Korra and uh, horseshoe crab, and uh, I'm also currently doing the long term monitoring uh, project. Uh, for the uh, Chao Jing, huh? it's a it's a small um, marine resource protect area, and uh, here I find something really interesting. During the COVID uh, nineteen uh, third level alert, so I'm going to share the slide for you. Okay, slide. Okay, so here is my title. What happened in the Chaoji Marine Resource Protects Area when the third level of, of uh, COVID-19? Uh, the okay, he, that's the brief introduction about myself. And uh, now I am in charge of the Industry and the Academy Division of the National Museum. Of marine science and technology. So uh, my two major projects, uh, one is for public, uh, it's for coral conservation and the host, uh, host crab the parenting project in school. And uh, the other important work I, I'm doing now is the long-term monitoring of the effectiveness of the Chaoqin Marine Resource Protect Area. Okay, so the story starts from the uh, May of 15, uh, 2021, and uh, because there's the outbreak of the COVID-19, so the government just announced the third label alert of the COVID-19. And uh, there is two important messages. One is you need to always wear the mask. The second one will be uh, you you are not allowed gathering 
unless indoor under five person and the outdoor under ten person, then there will be a, a problem because when you do the diving activity, uh, it's not it's very hard for you to wear a mask, and uh, the second one is because the Chao Jing is kind of very popular place for people uh, to go diving. So it's not possible to limit the, the number of person under the 10 person. Let me show you the data we have from the last year. Well, that's uh, 2020 and uh, 2021. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, during the June of 2020, the number within the one month is more than 20,000 people come to Chao Jing. And the uh, peak hour of the uh, diver, there were more than 30, uh, sorry, more than 3,000 people come to the protect area for diving. So that's not possible, the gathering under 10 person. That's the reason um, because the entrance of the uh, the pathway to to go diving is in the land is owned by the museum. This so the re, we we just uh, um, stop make announcement. No people are allowed to pass the entrance. This means no people are, are allowed to go diving due uh, during the third label. Uh, COVID-19 alert, but only if you want to do research or need to do some uh, underwater work, and uh, they can send send out their application, and uh, you are allowed to do it. But number will limit only uh, twenty percent per day to go to the marine protect area. Huh? so. So this, so if you see the the feature in the left side is the last year. So there are so many people, and the right side is this year. So the number just suddenly go down. But you, but on June, uh, on uh, in August, the number go up again because at the end of the month. We open the entries again because the government uh, cancel the third label uh, alert. Okay, so that mean last year there are many human impact on the marine protect area, but this year the diver who allowed to go it not only the number is the far less than last year, and the. Uh, also, they are all researchers who is really care about the environment. So let's see what happened during this period uh, in the marine protect uh, area. What happened? Oh. Last year, we recall a lot of coral damage because of so many human. Uh, the pressure from the diver is so huge. And also the damage of Cora we recall is it's about ten percent of the Cora. You can see some damage on the Cora. But during the the this year, the close period, the the Cora is very beautiful. You can't see any damage on the Cora. So it's kind of very clear evidence to show people. Uh, the damage last year is because too many divers go to the area. Okay. And the second thing we find is people will expect there are more fish, but because our marine protect area is the no tech marine protect area, it allow people to go in but not allow people to catch fish. So if you count the number of the fish, 
not much different from last year. But if you uh, uh, watch their behavior, it's different from last year. Oh, just like the, the left uh, photo. And normally the Morelia were hiding in the crab. They won't go out. But during the, the third labor alert, and uh, you can photo three Morelia in one photo. I mean, all the Morelia will come out because there are less people. And uh, another interest uh, uh, condition we find is the the people the, not not sorry not people the fish they swim slower than uh, slower than they was before, and uh, also the distance they swim is farther than last year when many. A human uh, around, so it's kind of even the number didn't tell us they they become more because it's already not take long. So the number is look like the same as the last year, but the behavior is different. The the you can find a fish is more more uh, feel free and the uh, meal and can can swim as as long as they like. And another thing is uh, we have a green turtle in this area. And uh, normally each year, the diver will record about three or four turtle in total. But this year, so far, we already have nine green turtle showing up. So this means less people, there are more turtle will show up, oh, okay? But we, we are not quite sure it's because the uh, people might say it's because the uh, they already have so many turtle just because the too many divers scare away of the turtle so they don't have the chance to have the chance to to make the photo but this year because there are less people so the diver had more chance to to photo uh, turtle so but but at least we know, and uh, according to the photo record, we have more turtle this year than last year. Okay, but not not everything. Uh, this is another uh, uh, work we are collaborated with the Academia Sinica, and uh, uh, that's the Dr. Harry Dean, and uh, we find out there are less. Low frequency noise during the long weekend of the Dragon Ball Festival. Dragon Ball Festival is kind of uh, very. Uh, it's kind of uh, a, a. They they always have a long weekend, and it's close to the summer. So if we see the 2020, uh, the Dragon Ball Festival, and the, that's the noise. Uh, across to the Dragon Ball Festival, there are more low frequency noise. But this year, the same long weekend, but there are less no noise. Okay. And then and that, that, if we, we see, see the, the underwater sound scan between 2020 and uh, 2021. And uh, you can see 2020, and the noise is less than you. The the noise is uh, is quite obvious last year, and uh, but this year, that's the red color last year, but this year is uh, uh, blue color, which means there are less noise. And uh, on the opposite, you see during the uh, night time, uh, it's very uh, quiet last year. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 this, this year, year, but this year, there are more 
，所以呃，轮到您讲的时候，稍微等差不多两三秒的时候再开始说话，这样可能那个 YouTube 转播过去会比较顺畅一点。另外一个 section 大概是这样子啊。那前一场那个林玉泉还在进，林玉泉，你问一下，你问一下那个赵慧芬赵校长，他有没有 PPT 要放？哎、欸，对啊，有有,有哦，好啊，赵校长来听到了。那校长您好，要不要呃测一下您的分享画面 ？Your your voice is very clear、oh, and uh, 呃，刚刚张校长已经测过了，然后我想要请赵校长这边也测一下。Mm. Sorry, I just finished my talk. Is just few slide to go, and、uh, so basically, I just want to uh. Express the difference of underwater substrate between 2020 and the 2021 is quite different. Okay. Okay. Eh? 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 What the hell? Okay. And.、Uh, But、uh, not everything is okay. We we see and then show the satellite image about the debris. But underwater, the debris will cover on coral. So、uh, during the third level COVID nineteen alert, we find a lot of、uh, debris cover on coral. Uh, without diver to clean up, the coral is going to、uh, in trouble. Maybe will die. So, so why I'm trying to send out the message is the some people may think it's better no、uh, marine protect area is、uh, totally no human to 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 go diving or. Any any use of the marine protect area, but in this case we find out if we have the some uh just like a marine volunteer help to clean up, it will good for the marine protect area. Sorry, a lot of trouble doing the speech. It's okay. Okay, I finish my talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor Chen, and thank you for your wonderful presentation. Especially, um, you are very uh delighted photos. I'm very delighted with your photo from charging uh protected areas, and I believe while the pandemic, uh, people uh rethink many things, and for example, the um MPA, the Marine Protected Area. And in the past, we think the prohibited people to come inside, and is a a, a very important measure to、uh, protect the areas. But nowadays, through your、uh, presentation, for the marine debris, we need to remove it. So it's another thing we need to consider. And、uh, nowadays,、um, I, I think.、Um, The marine protected areas is very important for、uh, the biodiversity. So,、uh, thank you for your、uh, presentation. And now,、uh, go back to the question I, I saw from the the Q and A box, and I believe there is one question for Elaine. Here mentioned about can we combine the AIS traffic.、Um, The AIS, the 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 light, um, and、uh, combined with the AIS and the remote sensing to、uh, find out the oil spilled from the ship, and can we identify which ship to discharge the oil? The answer is yes. Yes, absolutely. You can use the automated information from ships to to line up with the track of the oil pollution signature. One of the problems that is prevalent, however, is that 
some vessels we will turn off their AIS beacons and they go dark. Yeah. And so you can't see them by their trackers. But in radar data, you can identify structures and vessels on the marine surface. If it's visible imagery, it becomes very difficult because then you it's like what you would see with your eyes. You can't see the vessel. But absolutely. So NOAA, we don't follow up on which vessel is the polluter because it's the jurisdiction of the Coast Guard in the United States. But I know that for cases of pollution in Taiwan, they will do the full cycle AIS analysis, pollution analysis, and try to track down that vessel. But that, that's a great question. AIS is extremely important for identifying a polluter. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I think, um, do you have any other question? Or I have uh, one question for uh, Ilan and uh, Professor Ye, and also for uh, Dr. Chen, because um, we mentioned about the women uh, in power on marine science. How can how do you face frustration and uh, regain confidence during uh, learning or working? And I believe you must have many experiences on the, um, any kind of frustration. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know uh, which one of you will uh, talk about this. Thank you. How about you then? <clears throat> we would like to uh, <clears throat> hear what, what you what you saw about this uh, issue? Thank you for the question. <laughs> it, it can be very difficult to be a woman in science. One statistic that I looked up ahead of this presentation, so my degrees are in meteorology and atmospheric science, and I noticed that in the United States, there's only 25 percent of working meteorologists that are female. So it's a very male dominated sector. I think women, however, are uniquely suited to be leaders. We already lead our families. Um, you know, as a mom, I'm leading my kids. I'm being a role model for my kids. So I, I have to just remember that I can be confident in the professional realm. So my passion is science, so I can pursue science with the and lead with the same confidence that I do with my family. And I'm very lucky and fortunate to have support. Um, I've also been very fortunate and lucky that the, the group of people that I supervise, which is mostly male, I get a lot of respect but I also, you know, have set myself up where they know I will not tolerate anything less than respect and to be treated equally. And so I've been very successful as a supervisor in NOAA so far, but it's about the confidence and setting a precedence and uh, taking your rightful place in the leadership chain <laughs> in science. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, I, I think uh, because it's the, the time. And uh, so um, if uh, Professor Ye want to share in one minute or, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, communication, communication, communication. <laughs> 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 over, over good food. And beer. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I think it's time up. And um, uh, thank you, Ilan and um, Professor Ye and uh, Dr. Chen for your uh, wonderful experience in uh, this issue. And um, hope uh, I hope we can uh, see each other soon. And uh, have a nice day. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.
Bye-bye. Bye.